firstly, thanks for being here. Thank you to Designers and Geeks. Thank you to Yelp for the great use of the space, and thanks for setting up all the AV. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just talk. I'm going to try and leave as much time as possible for like questions and conversation at the end, because that's much more interesting than just hearing me witter on about things that occurred to me this week. Um, so, but with that, I'll just keep going, I think. Right, so um, I'm going to do a little bit about myself so these are my things that you can get to so you can like look on instagram or post things as we speak i use this hashtag called jim speaks so if there's things that i think things that i say that you think is interesting you can always use those as little quotes and uh, attach it to that and there's also designers and geeks there as well just a bit of housekeeping i suppose and i'm going to talk about myself a little bit just to give you a bit of a picture because some of you may know who move brands is Fewer of you may know who I am, but not really, really. I'm not really that famous yet. Give me another week or so. Um, but I live and work in San Francisco. I've got this stupid fucking British accent, which gets in the way all the time. Um, and I'm all, always asked to like pronounce things and slow down. I tend to talk really quickly and all those sort of things. So if I'm doing any of that, just ask me. But I live and work in San Francisco. I work a bit in New York. We've got a New York studio out there. And I'm down in LA quite a lot. I'm not really a Lakers fan, but I'm down there wearing the hat um, a little bit when we're doing work down in LA as well. But I come from this place called the Isle of Wight. Does anyone know where that is? It's in the UK. It's this tiny little island off the coast of the UK. It's like the Barbados of America or something. No, it's a cool place though, but it's not, uh, it's famous for a few weird things. Has this got a laser pointer? It's wicked. This is an iguanodon or an iguanodon depending on how you want to say it, and they discovered these on the Isle of Wight. This is a, the Isle of Wight Music Festival, which was a big thing in the 60s. It was like the Woodstock of the UK, so like a crap Woodstock. Um, this is that same music festival now called the Isle of Wight Festival. It's still going. They started back up about 15 years ago. It's a really big festival, and it looks like that. We have the Six Wonders of the Isle of Wight, <laughs> which are a bit like the Six Wonders of the World, but really not very wondrous. They say things like downs that you go up and cows that you can't milk and stuff like that. It's basically the names of places. It's, it's really fun. And then the, this guy is an Isle of Wight surfer. We've got a big surf culture, much better and bigger than the one here in California. And that is accompanied by weed culture because a lot of the weed that comes into the UK goes through the Isle of Wight because it's got really lax borders. Anyway, that's the Isle of Wight. That's where I grew up. That's what I did do still a little bit. And I went to a place called Central St. Martins, which was a college in London. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. Anyone? Yeah, it's, it's famous, it's cool. And some, some other cool people went there. I like saying that. Um, Alexander McQueen, he did a load of fashion stuff that looks like that. He's dead, but cool. Gilbert and George, they did a load of um, art-based stuff. One of my favorite sort of art duos of all time. Not dead. Maybe dead, not sure. Anthony Gormley, great sculptor artist, uh, did a load of really good stuff. And then this girl down here was in the year below me studying graphic design, but she's called MIA. She's a musician. You probably remember her for giving the finger at the Super Bowl. Do you remember that? That was her. Anyway, she's cool. Um, anyway, moving brands, we're in a few places. We're in San Francisco, we're in New York. We've got studios at both those places. We've also got a small uh, studio in Zurich but the main bulk of our business is in London. And I started that business back in 1998, uh, straight out of college. So I graduated and within a few weeks, we'd collected together as a group of people. And within a few months, we'd set up our own business um, without really knowing what we were doing. We were sort of dumb, young, talented, and full of gusto, I suppose. And we just set the thing up. Um, and what Moving Brands does is these four things. We do branding, so that's the story behind the brand, how a brand might be named, the brand identity, the identity system that goes along with that, all the communications that go along with that as well. So we do a lot of comms and digital comms for clients. We also do experience design, so a lot of digital design and a lot of stuff I'm gonna talk about tonight is much more in this sort of experience design realm. And also business design, which is actually working with clients. I suppose it's a bit more like an IDO type offer, but we basically work with clients to ideate new products, new services, new things that they might uh, wanna do and go into and sort of use our design and creativity to sort of help them to find new products, services, and, uh, and uh, stuff, basically. 
And what that means is, is we do work like this. So we do a lot of work with the BBC. We've helped write the central story for Virgin. We did the rebrand, re-envisioning of HP, which you're now seeing on like laptops and all kinds of stuff. Um, lots of work in Europe for telecoms companies like Air and Swisscom. We did the redesign of the Netflix logo. Asana is like a Bay Area thing. We do a lot of Bay Area startup businesses. We worked with Asana for a number of years to make them really cool. We do a bit of work with Google that we can never talk about and lots of other stuff. But we're basically very, very broad and do work across lots and lots of different businesses. And that's it. So that's all about moving brands. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a picture. Now, we I've been thinking about this thing about designing for a changing reality. Last time I was here, I was talking about things like VR and AR and MR and all these other things that were going to change the way that we might need to behave as designers and the sort of things that we might need to look at. And recently, because you, I found myself in meetings going virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and everyone's got slightly different versions of those things, although they're very clear what the differences are, I've actually just started calling all of that stuff next realities. I've heard some other people say new realities, but just a neater way of talking about it. So if I say next realities a few times, you basically know what I'm talking about. It's kind of this stuff. And I think there's, a, there's something going on in the fact that at the moment, I'm seeing a lot of stuff in VR uh, and MR and next realities uh, that's still sort of locked to a certain way of thinking. It seems like we're designing sort of websites and experiences, but transferring them to these worlds that kind of float and transfer them to these worlds that are slightly different. But it strikes me that in a world that is without those same restraints that we shouldn't really be doing that. I mean, uh, if I see another weather augmented reality thing that's a floating rectangle with a weather in it, so it looks like it's pulled off an app and put in VR or AR or an MR, I'm going to explode because it just doesn't seem right. Because the opportunity is to be labelless on product and have that only on product and updated and full of lots and lots of media and technology and all kinds of stuff when you're in choosing to be in that um, next reality world. The opportunity is that we won't need really need billboards because you'll be able to attach information and advertising and whatever you want to any object. So therefore, the normal rules of where all of that stuff's going to be will gradually disappear. You're going to get a lot of information that you're going to have to deal with and what are the ways that design and us as designers are going to deal with that. And even in this example, it's a fairly early example, but you can still see they're kind of trapped in this rectangular kind of way of thinking about how people want to view information. You've got businesses like Magic Leap doing this kind of stuff, which is much more augmented and mixed, where you've got characters and new types of ways of interacting come into life. And then finally, this one, I'm not sure what this is really, but it's basically the same idea as this. It's like the way branding can work in these new realities is going to be really interesting. Now, I don't have all the answers, but these are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about, and maybe these are the things that we can have a conversation about later. So there is this world sort of coming where, and you're either going to agree with this or not, or some sort of mixture of what I'm saying, but there's something coming up which is a bit like the death of the rectangle. You know, you're already seeing lots of products where we're not having to be in this rectangular screen format to be able to interact, to be able to call up information, to be able to be given design and have displays that can basically be any shape or display -less. So as designers, how are we going to cope with that? Because it's certainly not going to be, like if you're really damning of the way we design now, it's still basically publishing for print transferred into something which is a lot more engaging. But it's still got the same sort of parameters. We still think about borders and edges and corners. And it's still about composition within a rectangle. And if that disappears, what are we going to be doing? How are we going to be bringing that to life? What are the new sort of ways that we need to think about that? And so they're the sort of things that are preoccupying my time at the moment. And then on top of that, uh, the impact of machine learning and AI on all of that, on top of these new ways that things can be brought to life, even gets more interesting. So suddenly, you're in this world. And I've had lots of conversations with people, and I keep seeing these sort of two opinions emerging. One is AI, AI will be a powerful tool for me as a designer. And then there's this other one, which is AI won't need designers. And I'm a bit more in this. Eventually, I don't think AI will need designers. We, we won't need to do the things that we're doing now at all. 
Whereas there's another point of view, which is, well, we'll always need a designer, we'll always need the creative to kind of tell those AIs, that machine learning, what to do. But to me, that's kind of like, yes, for a bit, but what happens past that? And actually, do we want to push past that into a world where we're not needed as designers? Or do we just think that that's not possible? So that's something to think about as well. I don't know if you want to talk about that now. No. All right. But in this AI will be a powerful tool for designers, there's this role of the designer, and I started calling it like a design engineer, which maybe is already a term. I don't know. But I just thought about it like, well, you're more like a designer that's like pulling levers and telling AI what to do and the parameters and that sort of stuff. So design engineers, designing will be defining the problem or designers will be defining the problem. Designers will set up and select the AI systems that they want to use because there might be a series of different AIs that you can use for different types of tasks and how do you want to use those. Design will be tar um, defined by the task and parameters that you need. Designers will then train the AI. You hear a lot about AIs having to be sort of trained and have trial runs on getting things right and how they actually learn how to problem solve. So a designer will be able to be in the mucks of all of that. AI will create outputs. Designers will evaluate and designers will deploy. And this is in this world. And you hear this sort of statement from a lot of smart businesses. Actually, part of this I ripped off from, uh, where did I rip it off from? Accenture. But I sort of changed a bit. But basically, they were talking about automization, but I used it in this context. But AI allows for the execution of digital outputs to eliminate repetitive tasks and liberate my workflow and help me concentrate on other more creative things. Kind of sounds cool, right? Does it? Or does anyone actually enjoy those sort of menial layout things? I don't. <coughs> but I think there's this AI won't need designers, which is a bit more like AI designers, where I, AI will define the problem, AI will set up and select the AI system, AI will define the task and parameters, AI will train the AI, AI will create the outputs, AI will evaluate, AI will deploy, and the sort of output there is, what the fuck do I do now? Because <laughs> as a designer, if, you, if that's happening around us, what are the things that we should be training ourselves in? What are the skills that we think we're going to need? How's all of that going to change? I've not thought about the time parameters on this. Maybe it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know. I've been in business for 20 years, and at that time, we weren't even really, we weren't really that teched up at all. Um, and when you're talking about the UK, which is basically like the US in the 1970s, I suppose. So we, you know, if you think about the change that's happened in the last 20 years and then apply that to now, but it seems like even in the field of AI and machine learning, when you talk to people, they still talk in this way where they're not going to get... I was at another talk the other night, I can't remember who it was, but she was an expert in her field. She was kind of saying she doesn't think we'll ever be able to get to this point. And she knows what she's talking about, and I don't. But I feel like <laughs> this doesn't seem that unreasonable, doesn't seem that sort of far to push to me. Um, but basically, there's these two helpers. One is like, yay. That's really, really helping me. The other one is, what the fuck? And no, what do I do next? Um, but there's this something in between which is like, all right, maybe I just need to deny that that's happening, not learn any new skills, not push into these things, and maybe it will go away. But I don't think being in the middle would be a very good place to be. Um, but there's a different thing, because what we're talking about there is how AI machine learning could basically improve workflow, improve tasks. Um, maybe do parts of design for us, automize bits. Once we've done a design, it can like automate a lot of stuff. And there's already a lot of this already happening. There's lots of auto design happening from a single design, and then machines output lots of, you know, versions. But there's always this question about whether machines can really be creative. And again, I don't really know the answer to this, but I think the majority of design isn't that creative, anyways. Like, especially in digital, actually, uh, which. Maybe people don't like, but but really, there's like design skills and the process of design and the things that you learn as a designer, which are designer things. <laughs> then there's like practical considerations of everything you need to know and what practically is going to work. Then there's things that are logical, and then there's patterns in the design so that you can replicate them in the right way. And then there's about being predictive with the design and adaptable with the design. But when you look at all those words and they're the sort of things I think is involved in a lot of design process, they don't feel like things that a machine can do. Like even as words, design, practical, logical, patterned, predictive, adaptable, 
could kind of feel like something that could be picked up by a, by a bit of a clunky machine that wouldn't take too long to sort of create. Um, but just whether that's the case or not, just leaving that on, on its own for a little bit. If they're the things that are involved with design, one of the things I think that's wrong right now is when you only work in this way, you get this thing called sheepism. And those of you here last time, I talked about this a bit more, but I've been fleshing out into more different examples of what <coughs> I mean by sheepism. What I mean by sheepism and what I mean by if you only go through these sort of processes to get to design is what happens is this, which is all the ride sharing apps and website experiences look exactly the same. Now, I don't know why that is, because I don't design these things. Had something to do with some of them for, in terms of a brand perspective. But it's really interesting that they've, you know, there's some nuances here, right? But the photography is the same. The typography is pretty much the same, although one's got a bit of a serif thing going on to be differentiated. The buttons are kind of highlighted in the same kind of way. The brands are sort of positioned similarly. Uh, the language is pretty much exactly the same. So my question to everyone is, why is that? Is that because that's the ultimate design for a ride-sharing experience online? Or is that because we are following patterns without realizing we are? Or is that because the process design isn't that hard, actually, and could be done by a machine? Next, these ones. I'm sure if I covered up the apps, uh, the logos, and if you didn't, if I swapped the products around, you'd have no way to pull apart Nest from Quickset. Or, I mean, this really surprised me, because I know Nest is a wonderful brand, and they did a lot of work on it, and it's great acumen, and they're, you know, ex-Apple, and all that kind of stuff. But then when you see some people that, okay, might have copied that thing, but it's interesting that it's so similar, it's almost pathetic, like it's literally pathetic. And I don't know if it's just like no balls in design, or if it's some of these other things that I'm talking about, and these are the things that I'm trying to like pull apart and work out. Here, you know, here's all the food apps, and some of these are gone now, but um, photography shot from above, okay, let's all do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> orange buttons, cool. No, wait, we'll have green button, okay. Um, you know, it's just madness. And some of you might work on these things, and I've, have I worked on these? No. Um, but it's just a bit odd. But I think part of it is because of that process that I was highlighting before. There's a logic to it. We're getting data back from people. We're user testing. There's the things that we think. There's the things that we've been taught about what good design is. We're trying to be differentiated, but at the same time, we also want people to like it. Basically equals, why bother, in my book. These are even more interesting. This is much newer. You know, you've got like some Mercedes and a few other people, I think that's Jaguar top right, all looking at how graphic user interface and the user interface and the experience in these cars is gonna look in the future. I was amazed how similar these look. I know blue's probably a good color because it's like easy on the eyes and all that sort of stuff, but it's pretty amazing how similar they all are. So to me, this is this thing, sheepism. And again here, and we know that you know, brands copy, but some of the things going on here is, is just amazing. Just even the style of photography, there's some subtleties, the color of the product. There's a lot of people following Apple on this, but again, the, the, the fact that that exists. I mean, I can't imagine being in this product team and doing this, can you? Why would you do that? What, what, what's the logic behind behaving in that way? Um, and then here, you know, this is a new product. That one's not so new. And, and you can actually see which one's newer. If I say which one of these is the newest, we probably all go, that's the newest. That one's the oldest. But again, really, really similar. And this essentially is a sort of microphone and a processor and a speaker that we can interact with. Why do they look so similar? I, it, like, are they all using the same technology in them? Is it just laziness? I actually think the texture on this and the texture on that is incredibly similar, even the shape of this. This is the first time I think I've really seen Apple and thought, wow, this is Apple endorsing that this is correct. <laughs> Interesting. And the top's even more worrying because you have this, I mean, maybe I just good like finding patterns and things that aren't there, I don't know. But they're all circular, cool. They've got like a color rim that rotates. These are color circles that rotate. And then Apple have taken that, it looks like, and done really fuzzy circles that rotate. 
these are four buttons in a, in a sort of formation like that. Okay, they're the sort of four dots. This one doesn't have them. But again, it's kind of interesting. Sort of, don't know what I'm talking about now. Anyway, so there's a sea of sameness across things, which I think maybe is a different issue, but I think it's somehow tied to the processes we go through and the things that we need to do. Um, so if you've got design and practical and logical and patterned and predictive and adaptable, you kind of only can get to, possibly, this sort of sheepism, sea of sameness result. Because logic and the practicality of the thing and the way we've taught ourselves as designers to behave and the economy of the thing as well, with design sprints and where you get to and all those things, you kind of get to quite a grey result in my point. So I think what needs to be added is like this randomness kind of thing. Um, I wrote a piece for Forbes. It wasn't very big. I might get out and read it. Um, <coughs> about how I generate good ideas. And I'm not sure. if It feels a bit sort of grandiose, but it's not meant to be. But it j basically says, over the years, I've perfected my own technique for coming up with new ideas. It's based on free association, where I weave together seemingly random moments, ideas and objects, whilst thinking about the brief itself. It's all about starting at the challenge, and as I allow the feelings and ideas, as and as I allow the feelings and ideas it evokes to fill my mind, I then let my thoughts wander towards different words, visuals, people, and objects as I arrive at a new perspective or a way of thinking. Have trust in free association and don't simply rely on data you have at hand. So, it's kind of little statement, and maybe this is just normal stuff to people. But the reason I'm talking about this is I'm trying to work out what AI might need to be able to be creative. Because I think it's something in this free association and this adding of a random thing, um, but the brain's ability to see the non-randomness in it, uh, but then use the randomness in it and reapply that to this stuff on the left that we're all very used to, be, to doing. And that's how you get something really good. And I don't know if you know these cards that are made by Brian Eno. They're pretty old now. They're, they're quite old. But they're called Oblique Strategies, and they're originally designed for musicians, I believe, who are in the studio. You've got a thing, you've mixed the bass like you normally do it, and you've mixed the treble like you normally do it, and you've added the effects and the vocal and all of those things. But for some reason, it's just not feeling special. Well, they developed these cards where you can pull one out the deck, and it basically says something, which then, if you act on it, you can create something a bit more special. So it says things like remove specifics and convert to ambiguities, um, emphasize, what does it say? If emphasize differences, go to an extreme, move back to a more comfortable place, be dirty, how would you have done it, all those things. And I like this thing about make an exhaustive list of everything you might do and do the last thing on the list. So it's adding a bit of randomness to the thought process. And people use these sort of techniques to create much more um, effective communications that are much more interesting. And I think there's something in this about how we could teach machines to do that process. Add the random thing to the logical thing to create a special thing. Because if we can only act and design on the logical thing, we won't get anything special. It's my point of view. And I also think in that designer's point of view is the route to how you actually get something to be creative. So I call it visual randomness. Um, I just showed a slide there that I shouldn't have done. But what I thought might be fun is, is anyone working on something that they're trying to solve? <laughs> like a design problem or something? No, no one's going to be brave enough, right? Well, maybe just picture what you're working on at the moment and the way that you are trying to solve things and think about what I've been talking about, the logic of the thing and you know, the process of the thing, the economics of the thing, um, how that's working, the design process that you normally go to. And then let add this image in your mind and see if it helps sort of like come up instantly with new ideas that have nothing to do with that logic, but somehow connected. It probably won't work. <laughs> Is anyone actually doing it? Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> exactly. So if you add an empty abyss of darkness to the problem, what happens? <laughs> He's doing the randomness thing constantly back. <laughs> what about this one? I actually got a bleakness from this image, not the roses. So it's, it's interesting that diff people got different things. I knew this one real well. 
and then picture the problem you've got right now or the thing that you're trying to design and add this one to it. <laughs> it's interesting though, because we're working with a sort of wine company at the moment and you get a whole like way that wine looks and works and all of that stuff. And it's so interesting to just put a random thing in the middle of that. Because if you suddenly put this in the middle of that, lots is possible. I mean, you can throw it away. This is the thing. It's not precious. I think it's just all right to add these random things. And that's pretty random anyway. It's a spaceman not in space. He clearly doesn't look real, so it's 3D. It's all over the place in terms of a bit of imagery. So, you know, I think it's interesting what can happen from that when you apply that kind of thinking to something. And like I say, this is a technique I use, but I don't actually use images. The thing I do is I sit at my desk, I read the brief, I have a lot of things. We've done brainstorms with the team. Everyone's like doing everything in their minds. But I often just drift off or I find myself staring at a person on the other side of the room or wooden texture. But there's something in that wooden texture and the fibrous nature of the wood and the way that it is all aligned and the colours in that and all kinds of things that can really add so much. Like if you go back to the roses and you said, all right, colour palette, suddenly it's really interesting because there's a natural palette in there that if you were to pull it all out and apply it to your design thinking, it could really work really well. Anyway, and then the last one is this, just my favourite image, I think. Uh, is this called Christina's World or something like that? It's a really famous painting. Um, but if you're trying to uh, solve some sort of product thing right now, tomorrow, just get this image up and look at that for five minutes. It'll help a lot. <laughs> so really, what we need to do is have design and practical, logical and patterned and predictive, add a random element, and then teach AI somehow how to do the normal design bit, which I think would be quite easy for them to do, and then add this randomness, and somehow we'll get to a creativity, and somehow maybe that creativity feeds back into the AI, and you can keep going. Um, so what we probably need to do in this world of new realities, next realities, and machine learning and AI is build a bleakness within AI to achieve creativity. So give it the ability to tangentize or something and come up with random factors and then work out how they are interesting and that's the route to be able to get AI to be creative, I think. Um, so in summary, Machine learning and AI will create new opportunities for designers and design. Really fundamental, I think. I think if you're a young designer starting out, this is where I'd concentrate efforts if I was you. I'm 43 years old, it's a bit late for me. I'm an old dog who likes drawing logos. But if you're starting out, I'd be in this world. I'd be trying to work out how these things work. I'd be trying to work out how I could be an expert in this sort of stuff to enable design to happen if you're interested in design. And we need to use next realities to create new design vernacular for a world without rectangles. So that's more about if we aren't going to have screens and if we aren't going to have rectangular based information and that's all going to be you know, tr transmittable and transferable and mappable onto any object or float within space, then that means the death of rectangle and what does type act like in a rectangleless world? What does photography act like? How do we view film? How do all these things work? I think there's some massive job for us all to do there collectively as design community to work out what that new vernacular, that new lexicon for design is. And then we need to embrace AI within design and to find new ways of creating and working. I think that's just about not being scared of it. You know, if I was on a chart of like really scared of AI versus bring it on, I'm definitely in the bring it on camp. I think the sooner it makes majority of design tasks obsolete, the better, because I think we can all concentrate on much more creative, much more interesting things. But it will mean that, you know, designers that concentrate on just lay laying things out and, you know, reproducing layouts and those sort of things, your job is basically on the way out. You're going to have to, like, relearn the trade somehow and get into other things. Um, oh, and some visual randomness is good to the process, so try and add that. But that's me, really. I thought...